Welcome to The Bill Walton Show, featuring conversations with leaders, entrepreneurs, artists and thinkers. Fresh perspectives on money, culture, politics and human flourishing. Interesting people, interesting things. Welcome to The Bill Walton Show. Newsflash. The New York Times has reported that the idea of the founding of the United States of America did not begin with the Declaration of Independence in 1776. No, we are informed that the actual founding of America occurred in 1619, the year 20 or so African slaves were brought to Jamestown, Virginia. The Times tells us in an ongoing project that the American Revolution occurred primarily because of the Americans' desire to keep their slaves and that America is irrevocably and forever rooted in injustice and racism. To make sense of this, and also to talk about the Trump presidency, I'm here with two distinguished leaders and thinkers, Robert Woodson and Kenneth Blackwell. Robert Woodson is the founder and president of the Woodson Center and an influential leader on issues of poverty alleviation and empowering disadvantaged communities to become agents of their own uplift. A best-selling author, among his many honors, Bob's is the recipient of a MacArthur Genius Fellowship Award, the Bradley Prize, the Presidential Citizens Medal, and the 2018 William Wilberforce Award. Ken Blackwell is a senior fellow at the Family Research Council, also a national best-selling author, and serves on the boards of many of our leading conservative organizations. Ken has had a vast political career. He was mayor of Cincinnati, treasurer, and secretary of state for Ohio, undersecretary at the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, and U.S. ambassador to the United Nations Human Rights Commission. Ken is also an advisor to President Trump's re-election campaign. Bob, Ken, welcome. Pleased to be here. Good to be with you. It's great to be with you. Your resume is, and I only got about 10% of them, so uh, <laughs> I'm here with an impressive crew. Uh, Bob, you've launched the 1776 Project to uh, refute what's in the New York Times 1619 Project. W what's going on here? Where, what's the background for all this? And Well, first of all, let me just explain a little bit about my background. I, someone said I'm the only non-communist to get a MacArthur Award. <laughs> I was wondering yeah. about that. <laughs> I think they kind of slipped, I slipped through. Uh, and so I just want to clarify that. <laughs> that it doesn't really reflect on me. <laughs> but uh, as, a, as an organization that has been concerned for, for many decades about the uplift of the poor, particularly poor blacks, I was particularly outraged that the New York Times would really exploit America's birth defect of slavery mm -hmm. and weaponize race and use the conditions of, of the black community to, as a bludgeon against this country's character, almost defining it as if it's a criminal organization. Hmm. And, but, but what they're also doing is insulting, particularly insulting, is the assumption that as a consequence of our birth defect, that all whites are there for um, guilty and should be punished, and that all blacks are victims and should be pitied. <laughs> and what this does, it, it really is demeaning to black America to say to the country that we, are, we should be defined by oppression or slavery and that the current conditions of out of wedlock births at 70 percent and the violence on black on black violence is somehow related to something that happened 150 years ago that's mm -hmm. an insult and it, it assumes that we don't have the capacity to solve our own problems too so that's why we had launched a, an alternative ken you want to want to weigh well, in on your, again, your thoughts but i'm for 40 years i've been a friend of bob's and i've been able to be at his side and, and, and learn from him, but more importantly, learn from the people who he has empowered to be agents of their own upliftment. Uh, and he's done it in concrete terms, and I've watched folks who were in public housing uh, move through a system of independence where they now are owning their own 
house or they are managing the, the homes in which they live. Um, look, I had a great uncle. His name was D. Hart Hubbard. Uh, and that name is probably uh, unknown to most Americans. But he was the first black American to win an Olympic gold medal hmm. in track and field. And he, he won it in the Paris Games in 1920. Uh, uh, and uh, Excuse me. Yeah, 1924 Paris Games. And he won it against, uh, he was to compete against Eric Little in the 100-yard dash. Chariots of fire. Uh, and he was supposed to uh, run in the high hurdles and the, the, the long jump. But when he got to Paris, he was told that the 100-yard dash and the long jump um, and the uh, high hurdles were white-only events. <laughs> and he didn't get to compete. Uh, but he set the world record in the long jump. But he and Eric Little remained sort of pen pals. Uh, and when he came back home, he told my mom's generation, he said, you know, he, 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 he learned something. He, he thanked God for the lesson that was taught him by the example of Eric Little. And he said what he learned at that time was fidelity to faith. And I sort of run this through uh, the, the experience that I've had, not only in my life, but in my reading of the lives of others. And, and that is that we are a people who basically have a fidelity to faith. Secondly, we understand what, 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 what Lincoln said, and that is that America is not perfect, but it is perfectible. Mm. Uh, and, and so when I am engaged with folks like both of you all uh, in different levels, different settings, but for 40 years with, with Bob, I've watched him actually put a lot of the, the, the biblical underpinnings of our time in this country into motion in, by empowering folks and making them agents of their own upliftment and making them understand that the human condition isn't a spectator sport. You can't sit on the sidelines. You have to be engaged. Uh, and, and it's through being a witness of what the work he has done, but it, again, more important, as important, the work of the people that he's worked with. Well, the, the thing is so inspirational. The thing is so pernicious about the times is that they've got us born into an original sin, generation after generation after generation. It, it, it's, I guess, it's a white. It's in our DNA, and therefore, yeah. you can never do anything about it. And there's, you've written about this. This you have too on the issues of human agency. Yeah, and mm -hmm. you all of a sudden say. <laughs> gee, you're not responsible for your life. It's because of historical conditions that we can't reverse. See, what we did was we brought together an assembly of, of black scholars, not all black, but scholars, but also activists, mm -hmm. people whose very lives are the embodiment of the principles of our founders. Because no individual or nation should be judged based upon our birth defect. I said to a group, how many of us want to be judged by the worst things we did as a young person? This is the 77th, yeah, 1776. You've you got Shelby Stewart. Steele and Clarence Page and John McWhorter. Uh, John Ponder, ex-offender yeah. who just got pardoned by uh, the President Trump, um, who's used his life, his witness, as an ex-offender to help 2,000 people coming out of prison in Las Vegas with only a 6% recidivism rate, uh, join 40% uh, of the mentors of police officers, um, establishing and so that the, the city as a consequence has the lowest rate of interaction, negative interaction between police and minority communities. So they're, they're, they're not only uh, agents of transformation, but they're examples of when you take the principles of our founders and actually implement them to demonstrate that the, the adaption of these principles can create a better life and a better community. But this is in jeopardy by 1619 because we will discount the, the people in the past and in the present who are, who, are, who, are, who are engaging in activities that are having the consequence of improving the quality of life. Only in America do we have a, a country that has an Emancipation Proclamation. No other place in the, in the world. Look, and, and put it in today's terms. The uh, 1619 Project is nothing but a group of apologists for the expansion of the welfare state. 
You know, what we're talking about in 1776 is the creation of an opportunity society. Right. I mean, it, those are in straightforward terms. That's, 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 the, that's the, the clash. Uh, and and what, what Bob has done by assembling these, do, these doers and these thinkers uh, and these thinker-doers <laughs> uh, is that we, we are saying, oh, we can muscle up and we can, we can show through example why our expansion of an opportunity society and individual empowerment you know, is in keeping with Frederick Douglass's notion you know, that, that we all mm -hmm. have to be agents of, of, of our own, of our own well-being. You're watching the Bill Walton Show. I'm here with uh, Bob uh, Woodson and Ken Blackwell, and we're talking about the pernicious effect of the New York Times 1619 project and what we can do to refute it. Uh, Bob and Ken, you've mentioned principles. What are the key principles that you see that transcend race and, and uh, class? First of all, the expectation that all of us, that the, that the, um, uh, the victimizer might have knocked us down, but the victim has to get up. <laughs> if you get mugged by someone and you lay there and wait for them to come by and rescue you, you need to be taken to a mental hospital. <laughs> and so, first of all, it's, 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 it's a belief that people have within themselves the capacity to uplift. And all they need is an opportunity. And also, I think, faith in God, a nation that gives people that kind of opportunity, it's in other words, if you have expectation, it's important to provide the means for people to, to conform and, and apply that expectation. And that's, this is where opportunity can help. And uh, people with means have a, a responsibility to help those without it, but only if they're willing to help. I would do, no one should do more for you than you're willing to do for yourself. Well, you ticked off some... That's, yes. <laughs> and let, me, let me just go someplace where Joe Biden better not try to go again. And that is that second paragraph in the Declaration of Independence. My my dad, a World War II veteran, used to always say, you know, we hold these truths to be self-evident. He said, that's a highfalutin way of saying any knucklehead should be able to get this, <laughs> that we are all created equal. You know, it didn't say that if you're tall, if you're white, if you're black, if you're short, we're all created equal and we're endowed by our creator with certain inalienable rights, which means that there isn't a government on the face of the earth that can give us our fundamental human rights. Right. They are given, they can only protect and promote. Uh, and therefore, we don't have a dependence on government. You know, we have a dependence on a, an environment that allows us to flourish and achieve based on our abilities and our efforts. And at the time that was written, there was no other document right. or any other country on the yeah. planet, I, I, face of the planet, I, 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 that had ever come no, close and, to and, that. And our constitutions provided yeah. a means for us to refresh and renew yeah. uh, That's right. and revisit. And to, it was a mechanism to help us to generate reforms year, century after century. And that's what America is doing. We have had blacks, uh, we documented in our essays, who are born slaves who died millionaires. <clears throat> well, how do we but, answer the question... Well, the founding fathers that wrote this amazing document, well, many of them had slaves. So therefore, anything they said or did can be discounted because of what they were doing. Now, there was already a big trend in America at the time. Slavery was on its way out, particularly we got around to uh, towards the Civil War almost. But it, it was a fact that well, it's hard to... Uh, well, but these same people who say that, do they discontinue <clears throat> using the word liberty? Do they discontinue to use the word freedom? Do they discontinue to use the yeah. concept of independence? No. Uh, they they yeah. are basically saying that the dispenser of these things is a strong centralized government, and we basically say that's nonsense and it's not keeping. You know, there's there's been a clash between moral absolutes and relativism for a long time now. Uh, but what what the folks in 1619 overlook is, is what Bob said earlier. You know, we, a, we actually did come out of slavery, you know, uh, and, and there was a time when there was capital formation in black neighborhoods and they had banks and insurance companies and they were employers. And, and, and so it wasn't, you know, until the reestablishment of the black code and, and, and other Jim Crow mm -hmm 
you know, initiatives and laws uh, that we move back towards a, a dependency on, on, on government uh, and a, a, a reluctance to, to look at those things that can, that can contribute to your own or individual collective upliftment. And, and Bob, Bob, we worked at, and we challenged the Model Cities program. Always. Yeah, we, we challenged it because it created black communities, Latino communities, that were nothing more, and Appalachian, urban Appalachian communities, that were nothing more than conduit for capital. They, they prohibited creating the institutions that would turn capital over four, five, six times in a community and create wealth. They kept us focused on income but not wealth creation. We had had an experience with wealth creation, and Bob is a, a walking history book on this. So, but the, I, I say slavery is on its way out. But in most of America, it was certainly not in the South, but it, it, there was a huge constituency of uh, white Americans that, that thought it was uh, a sin and, and did course. a lot to stop it. And yet you read in the Times by the lead writer, Nicole Hannah-Jones, America wasn't a democracy until black Americans made it one. <laughs> That's what, what she got, what she's saying to us here. <laughs> I don't know. But you know, the, but the, see, this gets published in the New York Times not only and that, it's treated as uh, But again, they gospel. have a ground game. They, they're going to, the Pulitzer organization has taken this, in, uh, this uh, uh, document and now they're behind the 3,000 yeah. schools around the country. They're doing plays. They're doing movies. I mean, again, they, they have a ground game. It's indoctrination, and, and, and it is not education. I, and, and by what measurement? In, in, in 240 odd years, America is the most diverse, the, the wealthiest democratic country in the world. We do it through constitutional uh, uh, Republican government, yeah. but the, 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 the fact of the matter is that you can't argue with that. And, and that's why it was so, been so interesting for me to watch how the president came in and he said, I'm going to reverse the flow of capital. There are two, three trillion dollars offshore just sitting on the fence because of our regulatory uh, environment, because of our tax environment. He said, so I'm going to change that environment and see if I can redirect capital back into this country. Yeah. Now the capital is coming back into this country, and what we have been working on is how do we, in fact, create environments where that capital comes back into these neighborhoods that have been neglected and been on the hook for expanded government welfare as opposed to wealth creation, well, let's and we know the talents there. Let's let's we are. Well, I do want to get. I do want to get into the indoctrination project. I want to talk a bit about Harold Zinn in a minute. But Bob, you've done a lot of interesting work on what Black America looked like, sort of pre nineteen sixty five great society that had just the opposite effect. And there was an incredibly vibrant uh, Black community oh, right. throughout America. Something like ninety percent of the families in in New York City, Black families. Husband, wife, raising kids. I mean, you know, sort of Ozzie and Harriet. I think it, there's so many examples. For instance, uh, at the end of slavery, 75% uh, of all ex-slaves were illiterate. In less than 50 years, that number went down to like 35%. And the, the, uh, the Freedmen's Bureau said that when they sent government agents south to help, they said there's nothing we can do that the black community isn't doing for themselves. Hadn't already been doing for Had themselves. Hadn't already doing for themselves. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we had uh, maybe 20 blacks or born slaves who died millionaires. And when, when we were fused uh, banks, we established our own. We had our own railroad that operated in Baltimore, Maryland. In 1868, when a 1,000 blacks were fired for striking, our response was to uh, borrow $10,000 from our burial societies and finance our own railroad, the Chesapeake, Maine, Dry Dock, and Railroad Company. We operated from uh, Baltimore to Maine and hired back those workers, and including white workers. In Chicago, for instance, in 1929, 
there were 731 black-owned businesses and $100 million in real estate assets hmm. when the outer wedlock birth was 15%, and that was considered a scandal. So there, I could say 15%, 15 was considered a outer yeah. wedlock, yeah. and yeah. that was a scandal. Yeah. And, that, and even during the 30s, between the 1930 and 1940, and during the Depression, um, we have the highest marriage rate of any other group in America, and our strong Christian values help and serve as a shield. And so um, our elderly people could walk in our community without fear of being attacked by their grandkids. You, you, you're watching The Bill Walton Show, and I'm here with Ken Blackwell and Bob Woodson, and we're talking about the state of black America before the federal government came in and said, we're here to help you. <laughs> well, you know, uh, it, 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 the, the, the Great Society program, uh, the Model Cities program, if you go back and look at the underlying uh, policies of, of those programs, they created incenti incentives for the, uh, you know, the, the separation of the family. That's right. The, the, the destruction of the family. Uh, they, they, it became more profitable for a, a, a mother to have a, a child out of wedlock than to, in fact, stay with a husband, you know, that was working but it was of low income. I mean, it, it became a, a, a system of disincentives for, for marriage, disincentives for, for you know, self-control. It, it rewarded were, were these babies. Were these good intentions that drove this, or were there villains here? I mean, well, what, what's the motivation Cloud, behind... The, the, the scholars at, at Columbia University's Cloud and Piven, they were the ones who issued the paper. No, theirs was to... They wanted a redistribution of income in America, and they say what we can do is reveal the contradictions of capitalism by flooding them with welfare recipients. They said if we can separate work from income, it will make the father <laughs> redundant, and therefore school dropouts drug addiction, and whatnot, and they couldn't have done it alone. So the government poverty offices opened up and they actually recruited people, but then they had to denigrate the, the stigma that was attached to welfare because in the black community, it was an insult to say uh, it, it was on welfare. So what they did was they said that the nuclear family is Eurocentric and therefore racist, and the black power movement came along and, and gave support to it, the women's movement, who wanted men, to, fathers, to be redundant. So it was a combination. ACLU filed lawsuits against the welfare department demanding that the paternity of the child be revealed. So it was these combination of so social forces. So within about a three-year period in the 70s, millions of blacks flooded into the welfare system at a time when the unemployment rate for black men in New York was 4%. And so it created exactly what the social engineers at the time in New York, remember, went bankrupt. That's right. And that was their goal, to do this all over the country. And so 1619 is really the fulfillment and a continuation and fulfillment of that plan to really assault this nation. And, and again, it, it's, can, can, it's, it's, can, you were mayor of Cincinnati. Cincinnati. When yeah. were you mayor? In, in, in 70, late 70s, 80s. So how did you, uh, you continue with your point, but I'd also like to bring it back to your firsthand well, experience as mayor, what well, you saw well, happening. Well, one, in, of the, in, one of the things that was just fascinating to me was that <clears throat> people think it's just a matter of words. But when we move from a program that was called relief mm -hmm. to a program that was called welfare, you know, that was a, that was a major leap. You know, uh, it, look, there were times, particularly during the Depression, where relief was, was, was available to folks of all stripes. You know, but once it became welfare, it became, you know, a, a reinvention of a plantation system. You know, and, and, it, it, and that's, that, that became, to, to me, the 20th century plantation system. Or reparations. Re That's how the social scientists said welfare should not be considered uh, social insurance. It should be considered reparations. Yeah, and they I, actually used the word back then, uh, Cloud and Piven and some of the social scientists at the time, liberal social scientists. So there's a paper or a book that exists yeah, that was written yeah. by these guys you, you in 63, in 64. Yeah, we had a, 
this takes the self right next to the yeah. power to exactly. Zen. Exactly. Yeah. And coming back, look, as as a local leader, uh, we understood that uh, we saw the city's population go from 500,000 in 1960 uh, to let, uh, closer to 400,000 uh, in uh, 1980, and now it's around 310,000. Cincinnati. In Cincinnati. It, and, and, and so, you know, the, the migration patterns were, were very, very interesting. People went to where good, there were good schools, and they went to where there were safe neighborhoods. You know, and and as a consequence, one of the things that we had to do to bring in to bring back what I call net taxpayers, people who paid more in taxes than they demanded in service, was to create a competitive school system. You know, and secondly, we had to in fact make our neighborhoods safe. And and then the third thing was to develop a capital base of our physical plants, you know. That, that would be attractive to capital investment. But the, what we did was that we moved to school choice, you know, uh, and, 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 and became, we, we worked with our archdiocese and our public school system, and we said, hey, all of us will die on the vine if we, in fact, can't give the consumer a choice for quality education. And it was unprecedented cooperation between the two school systems. Now, I have a, a stake in this because my wife, Rosa, was superintendent of the public schools at a time when she brought them out of emergency to good standing. But it was because she was she was not afraid to create a choice system within the school system and to work cooperatively with the archdiocese. Well, and you, you two are very close to this. Uh, in your view, what, what, uh, what caused the destruction of the urban inner city public schools? schools. I mean, they were pretty vibrant in the 50s, and then now we're having something, now we've got something which doesn't work at all. What uh... Again, it's all part of what I described about the whole disintegration of the families. If you have yeah. uh, black families in uh, 60, 85% uh, of all black families in the 60s have a man and a woman raising children, and that goes to less than 25%, the kids who are coming to schools are not prepared to take advantage of the opportunity. So you can't really blame the schools either. Uh, but, but, and That's also the, the, the union teachers, um, they have uh, no, no, uh, all kind of clauses. That so it's the breakdown of the family system. And, more, and more, the more than the schools. schools well, 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 and, and, and just think about this. Yeah. When, when we were coming up, <clears throat> yeah, there, our schools were segregated and they started to integrate right when I got into the ninth or 10th grade. But the reality was that there was a connectedness right. between work, home, school, and church. You know, and right. it was the, the, the cutting of those ties and that connectedness. Uh, and then taking kids out of the neighborhood on the, on the, on the basis of this numbers game as opposed to true integration <laughs> it, it, it was it was a joke so we we in fact took away from young people you know that network of institutions that connectedness that gave them a foundation or a springboard for for upliftment there's always been in the black community uh, I grew up and I was born in, in the depression and in the black community there's never been kind of economic integration. We wealthy <laughs> blacks did not live where my, where my family lived because we were all blue collar. They were dri driving trash trucks. And so all, even then had, we were complaining about income had, inequality. But, yeah, but, <laughs> but uh, at our segregated elementary school, uh, plays were held at night so parents could attend. And you would have hundreds of lunch pails on the table in the back because that's how attentive parents were. 80, all of the households had a man and woman raising children. Yeah. Poverty was never associated with dysfunction. And, 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 and middle class was not defined by income, it was by a set of values. And, and, but that has all disintegrated. Whenever you b break up the family, yeah. and, and whenever you assault uh, the faith, and what, what 1619 does, it says that Christian faith is, is homophobic. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, well, and the and the nuclear family is racist. I mean, the very attack on the on the, on the moral formation of of, of entities that displayed our our survival. And then fast forward to the '90s. I had a reading program in Chicago in the inner city schools, and it was based on the Sylvan learning, where you have a tutor and three kids there, and we could take kids with very little skills and teach them how to read. But part of the program was to bring the parents in once every six weeks to show what was happening. We'd have parents' night, and nobody would show up. Well, look, that's, that's in 90, what would that be, 90, 90 uh, 92, 93, something like that? Yeah, let me, let me challenge you on this a bit, because this is what an argument, uh, a discussion I have with conservatives, too. And that is, if the, you can't just parachute in good ideas into communities you need to first go in and find out what, who is already, where do the kids turn to in those communities where there are centers of trust and confidence, mm -hmm. and then you go there and partner with them. I mean, if parachuting in come, doesn't work coming from the government, it's not going to work coming from a well-meaning private source. And so what we do at the Woodson Center is that we work with people who want to help, but we first go in and find out what is already going on in that community. You can't assume that there's no capacity and they're not parents, they're not grassroots leaders already in there. And once you go in and you partner with the local groups and then let them invite the children in. A quick example of, a, uh, of, a, of, a, of, of a, an abuse center here. Every year volunteers would collect toys and give them to the, uh, to the kids. And everybody was happy but the parents. The second year, <laughs> the director of the program allowed the moms to work and volunteer to earn toy vouchers. And so the Christmas party, the toys that were collected and put in a store, and the mothers who earned toy vouchers went in and shot for their own children. At the Christmas party, they gave the toys mm -hmm. to the kids instead of these volunteers. So the, I just think well-meaning people, what the Woodson Center is trying to articulate is a strategy to demonstrate to people how you empower uh, uh, communities by building from what within what's already there, and then you will see. Uh, okay. We had the well, same thing in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. We we have young adults in the schools who are moral mentors and character coaches, and really uh, dramatically reducing the violence and the suspensions. So the young people said, "We're not getting the parents involved. So how can we adjust that?" So they got themselves qualified as IRS tax preparers. And they told parents, we're going to help you prepare your taxes. And they came out by, they got $670,000 were returned. And then they worked with the banks because most black and Hispanic households are non-banked. So a condition of you getting your taxes, you had to open bank accounts. And then the second year, $1.2 but see, if you go and ask people in there what are creative ways to get parents involved, they will come up with all kinds of creative ways. Now we don't have any problems of parents being involved. But again, the idea, the innovation, the creativity comes from what I call the social entrepreneurs that are indigenous to these low-income communities. We as conservatives must partner with them whenever we want to start something and build I, I, from within. I'll, I'll give you an Ken. example. You all know Robert Poole at the Reason Foundation. Oh, yeah. All right. So He's, he's been here. Yeah, it was, it's fascinating. When I, was, when I was a council member, I, I uh, looked at Robert's book. I think it was Privatizing City Hall. And so I started to look at city services that we could actually contract out or create a competitive model for. And waste collection was the first mm -hmm. stop. Well, the unions beat me. But right next door, 90 miles, was Steve Goldsmith. And Steve Goldsmith, in fact, said, look, many of the folks who are collecting our, our, our waste were, are, were minorities. They know how to do it. They created incubators and they created businesses and these guys competed with one another. It drove the cost of waste collection down, but it also empowered mm -hmm. through the creation of small businesses, these folks who actually knew what they were doing and could do it effectively and efficiently. And so that, 
Yeah. So we moved away from the government. He moved away from the government model. Steve Goldsmith yeah. was the mayor of Indianapolis. Mm-hmm. Then. Yeah. And we, we trained. We actually worked six years. You were there for six, six years. years, right. Yeah. Helped him. <laughs> not only that, but So Steve, this, was, this, was, this, was, this was you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but, but not only what Ken was saying, he That's privatized right. the maintenance of the parks. Right. At first, the black folks said, well, he's just trying to uh, uh, privatize like he can give his white friends in the suburbs contracts. He says no. So he contracted with the local black church to maintain the local parks. They hired uh, local teens to keep the parks clean. And as a consequence, they developed a sense of ownership. And so yeah. violence went down. And even when the kids were off duty, they protected the park. So Steve... Um, we also p- brought together 50 small business owners uh, in the Hallville area uh, and s- created a mini kind of chamber of commerce. Mm-hmm. And then Steve had the mall owners con- subcontract with the local businesses. So it just takes creativity. Sounds like we're going to need... Uh, you're watching The Bill Walton Show. I'm here with Bob Woodson and Ken Blackwell, and we're talking about empowering people in the, in the inner cities and... Uh, how it works and how we ought to be doing more of it. Ken? Bob, uh, Robert Poole inspires... Robert Poole, Reason Foundation, Robert, with, Libertarian, with, right. with, Private with, with, Sector with, Solutions, right. Not Government Solutions with, with, for with, All. With an idea and a book, yeah. there's a local official in Cincinnati that reads it. <clears throat> he reads, I read it, and I, I try to implement it in policy, but I get knocked down. Right. But, but who comes to Cincinnati because he has friends right up the road with Bob Woodson? And I, I get inspired by listening to Bob, and we continue, we continue to push. But he then goes 90 miles over to uh, Indianapolis, and they, and, they, and they actually do it. They accomplish it. So these are powerful ideas. You know, just like any entrepreneur, you don't always strike gold on your first initiative. You know, so you, you, you just keep plugging. And you, you go to people who know how to refine that idea and, and do it better. And that's what he did. He found a, in, in an environment. And, and that model was replicated in a number of, 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 of cities. And he but got the, reelected. But, but a look, white conservative prosecutor gets reelected in a public black city because he delivered concrete and specific remedies using the free market as the mechanism to do it. I want to come back to your principles because I want people to take away exactly what we think those first principles are. And you mentioned a strong Christian moral code, self-determination, mutual assistance, strong families and communities. And also you mentioned, Ken, work, home, school, church need to be knitted together. Is that the, is yes. that the, yes. is that the formula? You yeah. give with the expectation that someone has to give back for what they receive. Reciprocity, yeah, yeah, right. okay. And because at the That's end, where at, dignity at, comes at in. At the end of the day, as I told you guys off camera, the, 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 the theme of the Federation of Colored Women's Clubs was lifting as we climb. And that is exactly the, 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 the ethic that I think has to permeate our, our communities, lifting as we climb. The other one is identify where people want to be, not where they are. I had some middle class women come in. They were going to mentor some kids in inner city black school, some girls. And she said, I'm going home and change, put on my jeans. I said, why? No, you go to these girls the way you go to work and see what happens. So when they went with the girls and they said, well, how'd you get those earrings? How'd you hook up the shoes? How'd... In other words, I said, people identify. You want to identify where people want to be, not where they are. <laughs> That's like pimps never drive around in hoopties. I'm taking. I'm taking. Don't know what that means. <laughs> I'm taking notes here. I'm gonna. I'm gonna, Bill, I'm Bill, gonna pull Bill. together a book of quotations from Bob and Ken. But Bill, well, only Bill, a small Bill, number of people know Bill, what that Bill, is. Bill, Bill watch, watch, watch this one. <laughs> Bob, what did our grandparents and parents and our pastors teach us about mountains in our lives? Lord, don't move the mountain. Give me the strength to climb. <laughs> don't take away the stumbling block. Give me the strength to go around. If you all want to hear that, just go on YouTube and put, Lord, don't move the mountain, and listen to that gospel song. Lord, don't move the mountain. It is one of the most popular uh, gospels that the black community plays. Lord, don't move the mountain. Give me the strength to climb. I plan to do that. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, that's true. So, Ken, I know Bob doesn't do politics. You do. You're working with, with President Trump. Um, does he get what we're talking about here? Do you think that's part of one of the reasons he's been successful in connecting? Yeah. I, well, and particularly connecting with the black community. Well, well, look, this is what I continuously tell the campaign. You know, don't just show up every four years and make promises. And sure enough, this president, he stuck with his initiatives. And so whether you're, you're talking about the, the, in the macro sense, he redirected capital offshore back into the country and then tried to create and has tried to create environments through opportunity zones to make that more targeted into our neighborhood. What, what, what we have to do now is to work with those indigenous groups and individuals in those neighborhoods who know how to put that into play. And, and so we're, we're working. And How do we actualize and, that? Well, well one, it was, it was what, what we had to first recognize. We had to okay. recognize those yeah. people and those organizations that are at the community level making, it, making an impact. You know, we, we, we are great macro thinkers, but we, in fact, we're, we're, we're talking about doing stuff at the micro level. Dick Reardon, in 1990, was the first Republican mayor of Los Angeles in 35 years. That's because two years before he ran for office, he went into the low-income area of East L.A., Hispanic, and connected with Jenny Lichtenberg. She was a liberal Democratic nun. She had an after-school program. Dick Reardon recruited some of his friends and built a, a, a state-of-the-art facility there. He planted charitably, and then he harvested politically. But you don't plant and harvest in the same year. So two years after he made an investment, established relationships, he declared for the mayor's office. And this liberal nun had all the community and campaigned for him. And he was the first Republican. And when he got uh, uh, reelected, with 60% of most of the demographics, 25% of the black community, because, uh, as, and, and we see this demonstrated uh, politically in the Florida uh, gubernatorial election, right. where DeSantis won by 32,000 votes. And, and that's because 100,000 low-income black parents, right. because of choice and education, came out. came out and voted for DeSantis, the Republican. Now, this, uh, Gillum, who was the opponent had Oprah and President Obama campaigning for him, which means 100,000 low-income black parents voted against Oprah and, and President Obama, <laughs> Obama, which shows you their sophistication. If only Republicans who really uh, should be competitive, because it serves the interests of my low-income constituents, both parties to be mm -hmm. competitive in delivering but I, I'm surprised that people don't read his book or sit and, and, and use him as an, a model. If you plan charitably, you can harvest politically, but you don't show up on election day. Right. This is this is Reardon's book, or yeah, Dick Reardon. Dick Reardon. It's yeah. called the the, what's it, what's the, it called? the mayor. The mayor. The right. mayor. So Dick that's Reardon. That you, we should be reading. You should that. be yeah. reading that. Yeah. Book. And, 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 and again, I want to make sure <clears throat> the the president didn't just show up. No, and, he didn't. You know, 2016, and then drop it, and then resume That's the conversation right. in 2020. Yeah. He's been plugging away, and this is what my my prediction. You know, he got in 2016, he got uh, eight percent of the of the black vote. Uh, McCain and and um, Romney each got four percent. My prediction is that he, meaning President Trump, can get you know, 15 to 18 percent of the black so vote. True. And people look at me cross-sided, but there will be a lot of folks who will turn out just as they did in Florida because, one, his initiatives have made a difference in their lives. Uh, and, and, and two, uh, people know that they've been promised a lot by his Democrat counterparts, and, and, and it's been, they've dropped the ball. You know, and, and then... There's another line. Some of these younger blacks are entrepreneurial. You know, they, they don't want to be wards of the state. And, and, and so I think if we keep pushing and we show measurable results, and that's why it's so important 
to empower those people at the neighborhood level who are not, you know, just wishing to make a difference, but who have made a difference. Uh, you're watching the Bill Walton Show. I'm here with uh, Bob Woodson and Ken Blackwell, and we're talking about how we can really make a difference in the black communities with the with the principles that Bob and Ken have articulated and also some lines of action. Now, circling back to where we started, the 1619 Project, New York Times, seems to me that we're in a war of ideas. And if you follow competing their narratives, competing narratives, narratives. And mm -hmm. if you follow their narrative, you end up with dependence, despair, and anger. Right. That's right. Have, I missed, have I missed anything? Nope. You got it. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to go around. I'm going to be clutching 1619. I'm going to be, mm -hmm. but you're heading towards uh, the abyss, really. How do we, how do we win the war of ideas? You well, talked about well, that. Well, that's what before our we 1776 started. at the Woodson Center is launching. Yeah. We are launching a major campaign, uh, a, a retail campaign. Not only just publishing, we've already published uh, t uh, 14 essays, and it's going to be made into a book, but we're also commissioning 10 more. We're going to reach out to low-income whites. No one can advocate for low-income white people, and Ken and I are going to cooperate on something in, in, uh, that, that, that one of uh, Clarence Page said, we need to desegregate poverty, <laughs> and that's what we're going to do. But also, there's... Uh, uh, national security implications, because if, if, if a 10-year-old black kid is being bombarded for eight years in schools with 16, 19, it's going to grow up bitter. Why would that youngster, when he gets 18, want to defend the country against foreign um, adversaries well, nothing, or become you, you, a police you, you, officer? Where, where they hate the country. Well, well they hate, the, the police hate. officer applications are plummeting. Even though, as one of our scholars pointed out, um, that the, the people, black and brown people, are fighting, risking their lives to come into this country at a time when 1619 said this is the worst place for, for people of color. Well, uh, let me just underscore something that what I like about 1776 is that it's going to be intergenerational also. Yes. That's because, you know, Bob and I are kind of long in the tooth. You know, but there are some there are some folks. You don't look very uh, <laughs> old to me. I'm, I'm right there, there with you. There, there, you know, we, we've prided ourselves in, in, in modeling, but not only just modeling, but identifying folks who are making a difference, folks who have great potential, and, 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 and the integration of these activists and these thinkers and these doer thinkers, that's, that's, that's very important. But more importantly, uh, Frederick Douglass said, he who is whooped easiest is whooped most often. <laughs> and, and, and what 1776 says, that we're not going to let that false narrative beat the narrative that we know that is based on the integrity and the genius and the drive of black folk. And we have a lot of young people. Coleman <laughs> Hughes is an undergraduate, and he is a part of one of our scholars and a lot of our activists, as Ken said, uh, this is intergenerational. We are bringing a lot of these young people and giving them a voice. Right now, there's no place for them to publish because of their views, but we are a collection point. But again, we are raising the resources. How, how do we find the 7, 1776 Project you, website? By, by 1776 unites.com. Okay. Unites.com. And unites. let me underscore something that my, my wife told me I better listen to Bob on. She is from Mingo County, West Virginia. And she said, don't think all urban Appalachians right. are black. And, 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 I, I was going to raise that. And she says, you know, what she, she heard, she's heard Bob, and she says, desegregating poverty is very important. That's what we're going to do. Because what, what these folks will do with their identity politics is that they will, in fact, turn folks who should be locking arms against one another in a false competition. We are going to show that this country, you know, is not, you know, has moved past identity politics. And in fact, we can build a force, a political force for change and upliftment. So you're saying that, people. you know, one of the things we see out in Rappahannock County, Virginia, is that there is a real problem around rural white America. That right. a lot of the, a lot of the same destructive things that have happened in the urban communities happening there. So you're saying this is going to be yes, a part, of that, at, yeah. part of that. But the plantation owners, 
during the antebellum period silenced poor whites who suffered as a consequence of slavery because they, they didn't have jobs. They couldn't own land. Well, the uh, 1690s well, that was the, are doing the same thing that the plantation well, owners that did, was, that was, to use that, identity politics to that, silence yeah. them. And so they're doing the same thing to silence those blacks in the city so they don't have to ask why are blacks failing in systems run by their own people over the last 50 years. So to, to prevent them from asking those questions, those people were being told, oh, your problem is institutional racism. It's, in, it's, it's internal. And what is institutional racism? That's like white folks have. I a, was going to ask you, a, mm -hmm. what, what, what does that mean? You people have a remote control <laughs> that you ride through the black community and Oh, I do as a white yeah, person. Said, yeah, you're, you're the I'm symbol not, I'm of that not familiar white. With and that. you push that <laughs> in remote control which causes people to miseducate their children cause people to eat more than they should. And all those problems that we have is because of this white of remote control. And, and so we're going to do everything we can, 1619, to take that from you. But and, we don't want to take it too fast because we're making too much money yeah. with you having it. Well, there yeah. is that. Yeah. And, 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 and the, 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 the funny thing is that, you know, I, you know, we've been called everything, you know, from handkerchief heads to uncles. But these people don't know. We have fought redlining. We have fought. We, have we fought. meaning people uh, who no, believe that yeah, you yeah, do. Yeah, yeah. The, the, we we yeah. have fought, you know, uh, the, 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 those folks who have perpetuated, you know, division and, and institutional, and not racism, but an institutional network that reinforces poverty <laughs> and discourages independence and self upliftment. We fought them, and, and who do they who do they think run run, run these things? <laughs> George Soros. But I'm, but I'm really hopeful. <laughs> I I'm George really hopeful. Soros. But I, I just think people who defend this nation, we need to roll up our sleeves That's and pull right. out our checkbooks and invest in a retail strategy like we have. The way the left is investing in it, the the fact that they did a two point three million dollar ad that played during the, during the uh, Oscars. And also the NBA- 16, uh, 19? 19, yeah. Oh, the, yeah. The, the yeah. Watch, two, two and a half million a, dollar ad. A, 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 oh, yeah, commercial. Right. Yeah. It's a, a commercial. That and they're they putting ran. this in all the public schools. Oh, yeah. Now, oh, and they're putting it in the public schools. And uh, Montgomery County, Maryland just signed up. And in Chicago, uh, Buffalo, New York, uh, all the Washington, D.C. Oh. school system signed up. Who, who are your allies in this alliance? If we don't have any, let's get let's get us some. I mean, well, how can I think we, we're trying we to develop. We, sure. we have freedom-loving people yeah. who, who who believe in this nation. Um, they're joining us. Uh, I, on, on, I'm getting uh, our our website was just had has so many re the, the hits. And yeah, so, I mean, I mean, look, a couple I, minutes. Two minutes left. Yeah. We want to sum up kind of where we ought to be and where we ought to go, where me, we are where just, we ought to go. Let me just say they, they need to come and take a look at 1776. Uh, we are, we're not afraid to have anyone kick the tires. That's right. You know, we like, like I said, we've been around doing this for four or five decades. Mm -hmm. You know, so uh, you can look under the hood. <laughs> and and but, but once you look under the hood, you kick the tires and you see that we're this is the real deal, you know, you, you help, help us. Another reason that we have to do it is because America's problems, race is preventing us from looking at the pain. In Palo Alto, the suicide rate among wealthy white uh, kids is six times the national average. Six times in, in Palo Alto. The, you got volunteers at railroad crossings to prevent kids from jumping in front of trains. And so that mother of a 17-year-old who lost her life to suicide shares more in common with the black mother in public housing in D.C. who lost her 17 daughter to homicide. But to, to fill that hole, we got to put race aside and yeah. recognize that we've got to come up with well, solutions to the drug addiction that's sweeping the country. But we can't do that if we're just separated by well, race. We've got a whole other show because what you're seeing in Palo Alto is this notion you do not control your own life. Exactly. It's seeped into everybody's souls. Right. Yeah. And without the principles you've articulated. Well, and I would just uh, 
my 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 drop the mic comment is um, Bob and I we're not sprinters we're long distance runners. Okay, final words, Bob Ken. That's thank you. Uh, that's it for now. Thanks for watching the Bill Walton Show. Joining us, uh, you can find us on YouTube and all the major podcast platforms. And uh, looking forward to having you back for our next show. And looking forward to having you guys back. So thanks so much for. A, Thank excellent, you. Thank excellent you. conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Want more? Be sure to subscribe at thebillwaltonshow.com or on iTunes.